Welcome to this installment of the Secure Your DNS, Secure Your Network series. My name is Tim Rooney, Director of Product Management at Diamond IP, and the goal of this video series is to break down into bite-sized chunks the myriad ways the domain name system, or DNS, can be attacked or manipulated for nefarious purposes, and to suggest defensive measures that you can take to secure your DNS and thereby better secure your network. In this video, we're going to talk about domain hijacking, where the mechanism an attacker can use to, in essence, replace your location on the DNS domain tree. Let's first recall the DNS resolution process. Here on the diagram, we have a resolver. Let's say it's a stub resolver within your laptop, your phone, other device that uh, is connecting to the network. It, it gets an IP address typically through DHCP. And then along with that IP address, additional information is provided by DHCP, namely a couple of IP addresses that you can use to query for DNS. And these are the IP addresses of your local recursive DNS server. And whenever there's a web page brought up or a, another IP destination that's required, the resolver will be invoked to make a query to locate the IP addresses of the corresponding name that the application is requesting. So let's say upon that occurrence, my resolver is looking for www.example.com. It'll then issue a query to one of those recursive DNS servers for which I've been configured. And the recursive server will look in its cache. Does it have, has it had a question about this recently that is still in cache? If the answer is no, it'll basically then begin to traverse the domain tree. So it'll start by looking at its hints file. If it has no other information, um, related to the query, let's say we're starting from scratch here. So it'll look at its hints file, find it, an IP address of the root servers, it'll query one of the roots, and it'll issue a, what we call an iterative query, so it's turned off the recursion bit, basically recursion desired. It's asking just, can you give me the answer for www.example.com? And the root server, of course, is not going to give you the answer. It's going to say, well, you know, it's basically going to give you a blank answer section. Uh, but it'll give you in the authority section the name server um, records for the next level down in the tree. So following, if we look at the domain name from right to left, it'll give you the, I, the name servers of the .com domain. So it's kind of giving you the next layer down in the domain tree. The root is, of course, the root of the domain tree, and it's going to give you a referral through these NS records, name server records, uh, in the authority section and then the corresponding IP address is typically in the additional section of the response and that um, qualifies as a referral to the let's say .com TLD or top level domain DNS server. Now it likewise is also not going to provide an, ans an answer, definitive answer to www.example.com. It's going to then refer you down to example.com in much the same way that our root server referred us uh, down the tree and finally by using that information my recursive server will now, now be able to query one of the example.com name servers that I got through that NS record set from the .com server and it'll query one of those IP addresses and that example.com server being authoritative for that example.com zone will provide an answer back and in this case let's say it's 192.0.2.54 and if that all matches at the recursive server with respect to all the, the port numbers aligning and the question sections in Bailiwick and all that good stuff, it'll basically cache that answer. So again, remember the first step we looked in the cache, it wasn't there, so we had to go through the domain tree. Uh, now if someone else should ask for www.example.com, it'll be readily available in cache, at least until the time to live or TTL on that record expires. Having cached the record, it'll then reply back. Uh, to the resolver, okay, you're asking for www.example.com. It is on IP address 192.0.2.54, and the device will then be able to make that connection to that uh, using that web browser or whatever application you happen to be using. So this all happens in a matter of milliseconds. You may not even notice it uh, when you're querying or looking up a web page or what have you, but this is basically the behind-the-scenes process. Caching, of course, certainly improves the performance of that process, but in general, to build up that cache, this traversal of the domain tree is required. So, why would someone attack or hi try to hijack your domain? Well, basically, if they can impersonate example.com on the internet, they can basically put in any IP address for the www record or the email address or any other application or server destination that you might be trying to reach. Uh, you're trying to reach the legitimate version of that web server, let's say, 
but an attacker could redirect you to an imposter site that looks very much like uh, your destination site, and this way they could solicit uh, the uh, extraction of sensitive information, kind of fool you into giving um, financial or personal information that you may not want to share otherwise. So the impact, of course, is being directed or misdirected to imposter servers, which can then basically provide uh, uh, answers directing to imposter sites or destinations. The attack forms, there's basically um, the ability to, you know, to attack the server, let's say your master server. So within your servers, your example.com servers, let's say, you've also got the NS records. That's really where the authoritative set of NS name server records is located in the zone itself, example.com. The parent has a copy of those just because it needs to refer down through that process to navigate resolvers down the domain tree. Uh, so if someone were to hack your server and access those and manipulate the set of NSs that are in your server uh, configuration, uh, they could influence that because that actually is part of the cached information uh, that the resolver would have and might provide that or use that for future lookups for other hosts in example.com. Uh, and then the second form of attack is the parent registrar. So uh, depending on, let's say, example.com's parent is .com. So if someone were able to uh, log in as your account, let's say, and make changes to your NS records or blue records, what have you, uh, they would have a way to, in essence, redirect resolvers trying to gain access to your uh, legitimate destinations. So again, traversing down the tree, kind of looking at it from a tree perspective on the right here, we've got the root. Let's say we go down to .tld or .com in our prior example. And legitimately, we would go down to your domain .tld or example.com in our prior example. But if someone is able to manipulate the set of name server records for your domain .tld, they could actually end up uh, redirecting, or your resolver could actually select a, an imposter name server, query that name server, and get, uh, you know, again, the inappropriate information, let's say, with respect to destinations that the resolver is legitimately trying to connect to. So the attacker could basically manipulate all of the name servers, replace them, just place imposter name servers totally, or they could supplement that. One variant is to divert a portion of queries by just adding a name server or two record so that not every query for your domain goes to the uh, attacker site, but only a portion of those queries. So this is intended to be a little less uh, obvious. So all of your name server traffic doesn't drop to zero. Uh, you do see a slight decrease perhaps, and then some of the other um, queries are going to the imposters uh, name servers, which again has detrimental impacts for those people trying to reach your sites legitimately. So what can you do to mitigate this type of attack well, certainly you want to implement server controls to harden your defenses from hackers. Uh, really, on your name servers, your uh, internet-facing, external, as we say, uh, authoritative name servers that are, you have your uh, information published on, uh, you want to make sure you're utilizing hardening. So you've got only the legitimate services, users, permissions, et cetera, all those server hardening tactics, which actually we'll talk about in a separate video. Uh, down to the kernel level, I.O., etc. And then also, on top of that, the DNS level configuration. So making sure that uh, uh, any kind of controls, like refle anti-reflection controls, you can implement other types of controls, again, just to uh, try to minimize the uh, susceptibility to someone gaining access to the server, other vulnerabilities in your version of the DNS software, etc. Making sure you keep on top of those and patch those as required. Um, and then also perhaps looking at, uh, you know, checking for changes that might have occurred. You know, your, your version of what you think is on the name server. And then checking what's actually on each of your name servers, uh, just to confirm that it's reflecting what you intend to be there. Again, should anybody attack in a way that is undetected and manipulate information, you want to try to catch that, uh, obviously, as soon as you can. The second mechanism here is to monitor query traffic. So we talked about the siphoning off of traffic. You know, certainly if someone manipulates all of your name server records, you're not gonna see it, pretty much any name server uh, queries coming into your legitimate name servers. All of them will be going to attacker servers. So that's, a, that's hopefully if you're looking at that, you'll be able to detect that pretty quickly 
little harder to detect is going to be someone who just adds a name, share of a record or two to your parent zone or to your zone file and, and siphons off some of your query traffic. But again, just looking at kind of history, any kind of anomalies you notice with decreasing traffic uh, might be something to just trigger perhaps an investigation, not necessarily a panic, but something that might warrant looking into. And then monitoring your and your parent's own NS and GLUE records, resource record sets. Uh, so again, the name servers, the NS records, and GLUE are the A and Quad A address records that correspond to those names and make sure they likewise match what you intend them to be and run periodic checks looking, you know, querying for these records on the parent zone on your servers and just uh, looking for any kind of additions that you were not authorized, deletions or modifies so that you're able to be alerted of any changes uh, that, you know, certainly the changes you make, you want to make sure that they were made correctly. Any changes that you detect that were not authorized Certainly, that would raise a flag that would require some investigation to first recover from the situation, rectify the information there, and then look to uh, uh, respond by, um, well, respond first and then recover by looking at ways you can enhance the controls there, tighten up that uh, vulnerability that was exposed, and look for ways to provide perhaps uh, more rapid detection. So hopefully this provided you a brief overview of what domain hijacking is and what you can do to prevent the occurrence on your DNS servers.